How do you deal with anxiety? That's a good question, isn't it? It's a good question because anxiety and worry are very common problems. For example, if you're a student, you might be a little bit anxious about how the first test of the school year is going to go. Or maybe you're a little anxious about the new grade that you've entered, whether you'll be able to, to keep up with all the homework. Or maybe you're a little anxious about whether you'll fit in at a, at a new school. If you're in a relationship, maybe you have a little bit of anxiety. I mean, teenagers anxious about their first date, they're not the only ones who have worries about relationships. Even if you already have a spouse, perhaps you're a little worried and anxious about some tensions in your marriage. And then there are the anxieties that come from health issues, right? I would imagine there are many of you sitting here today who have spent some hours anxiously sitting in a waiting room for a family member or a friend who is in a surgery. Perhaps you've passed a sleepless night yourself in your own bed or in a hospital bed, worried and anxious about a, a personal health problem. As you know, I haven't even touched on any of the worries and anxieties that come from things like money and bills or for anything else. What's the answer to all of this anxiety? Well, one of the most common answers that people in this world have for anxiety is to get away from it, right? Have you ever known someone who took a vacation just to get away from the stress at work? Have you ever looked down at your own phone and kind of smiled to yourself that there are no bars of service at that cabin up north for your boss or your clients to get a hold of you? Have you ever, have you ever been pretty happy about that out-of-state vacation where you couldn't check your email for things from work. And you know, even if people can't get away from anxiety by physically leaving it behind on a vacation, they so often will try to put some kind of distance between themselves and that anxiety. For instance, a man who has anxieties and worries in his home life and his marriage relationship may bury himself in his work. A woman who is stressed about her job may spend a, a lot of time socializing with friends to get her mind off of it. There are people who will pay lots of money for a therapist to listen to their problems and at least get them off their chest. And there are still other people who will try to drown their problems with a bottle. One thing is certain though, anxiety is real. And anxiety is a very old problem. Because anxiety is such a significant and long-standing issue that, that human beings have wrestled with, it shouldn't surprise us that our Savior Jesus spoke about the issue of anxiety in his ministry on this earth. In fact, in our Gospel lesson, we heard a sermon by Jesus himself about this matter of anxiety. And so under the gracious guidance of the Holy Spirit, we want to consider our Savior's words, and we especially want to think about his words that tell us the answer to anxiety. Now before we talk about his answer to anxiety that the Savior gives, there is one misunderstanding that we should be sure to head off. And this misunderstanding is the thought that Christians are never anxious and never worried. Perhaps you yourself have, have wondered at some point or another in your life, am I really a Christian because you've wrestled with anxieties and doubts and worries? If the picture you have in your mind of a Christian is of someone who is always calm and never flustered, who never gets anxious or worried about anything, well then I have to tell you, you've got a wrong picture of a Christian. Yes, it is true that Christians have no need to worry. It is also true that God urges Christians not to worry. But it is equally true that because we are both sinners and saints, Christians do struggle with worry. That's the whole reason why Jesus had to address the top. It's because it is something that believers struggle with and find a problem that Jesus had to offer an answer to anxiety. And as Jesus gives us this answer to anxiety, he starts with the heart where he needs to. After all, you don't worry with your hands, you don't worry 
worry with your feet. You don't even worry with your colon or your spleen. You worry with your heart. And so Jesus said, no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. It's kind of unfortunate, the word money there in that text, that really doesn't convey the full thought of what Jesus was talking about. The word Jesus used in the original Greek is the word mammon. And really there isn't a, a good English equivalent to that word mammon. In Greek, that word mammon refers to money, property, possessions, goods, wealth, all the stuff that you need for this life on earth, as well as a lot of things that go beyond your needs. In fact, because there isn't a good English comparative term, some Bible translators in the past would often bring that term mammon right over into English, and so maybe some of you have heard that word before, even though it's Greek. Jesus points out, worry and anxiety tend to start with a heart that is set on mammon. And the reason why is because people tend to worry about the things that they care about. They tend to worry about the things that they value more than others. And the fact of the matter is, for most people, money and wealth and the stuff of this earth is the most important, most treasured stuff they can have. And if you watch people's actions, you can often see that attitude creep out, not only in big and obvious ways, but in small and subtle ways, just as an example. If someone has his heart set on money. You can sometimes see it in the, the attitude they take. If, if such a person has enough money to take care of the bills and to take care of the needs that they think they have in this life, usually they seem very carefree. But as soon as that money starts to run short, well then there's a change, right? Then they start to grow long on the worries and the anxieties. And if we're honest with ourselves, we too easily fall into that same temptation. I mean, why do you think it is that Jesus said to his disciples in our text, you cannot serve God and man? Why do you think the Apostle Paul wrote to Christians to warn them, the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. But as for you, O oh man of God, flee from these things. Why do you think the Holy Spirit urges Christians, keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have? Jesus knows how crooked and deceitful our hearts are. He knows how easily our hearts are led astray. And he knows just how much those sinful hearts long to take the mammon of this life and turn it into an idol to bow down and serve and love. But when we do that, that's when anxiety and worry start to creep in. And they creep in because that mammon that our sinful heart wants to, to love, that is something that is uncaring and unfeeling. And so because none of that mammon will ever care for you or feel for you, you have to do all of the caring and the feeling for it. And that's a miserable existence. Just listen to, to how the Holy Spirit inspired Solomon to describe that kind of a life. He said, again, I saw vanity under the sun. One person who has no other, either son or brother, to worry about, yet there is no end to all his toil, and his eyes are never satisfied with his riches. So he never asks, for whom am I toiling and depriving myself of pleasure? This also is vanity and an unhappy business. When mammon is your master, when it's what you set your heart on, then it demands that you spend all of your toil and all of your anxiety laboring for it because it will never labor or toil or be anxious for you. And that's not only true of mammon, it's true of anything else that you might make as your master, whether that's health or a relationship or fame. You will always be the one left anxious. Jesus describes what horrible masters these things are 
in order to compare them with a different master, God. You recall how Jesus said, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. What is this kingdom of God? What is this righteousness of God? Well, sadly to many people, when they hear about <coughs> seeking and pursuing the kingdom and righteousness of God, they think that that's really nothing more than trading one tyrant for another. They picture it as, as rather than using your effort and your labor to pile up money and wealth and things in this life, it means using your energy and your labor and your effort in order to win favor with God. For a lot of people, God's righteousness and His kingdom is trying to earn God's love so that you can have a place with Him in heaven. However, that is not what God's righteousness is. Instead, God's righteousness, it's not the righteousness we earn by our works, but it's, it's the righteousness that God gives to us through faith in Christ Jesus. Paul was very, very clear about that when God inspired him to write to the Roman Christians. Now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, apart from God's requirements. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. In the same way. God's kingdom is not about a set of rules governing life on this earth. Instead, as God says through Paul, the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. In short, God's kingdom and his righteousness are about all of the gifts that he gives to us through his ruling activity in the world. God is a very different master from mammon. Whereas mammon demands that you work and labor in order to get and keep it, God is a master who is anxious for you. He is eager to freely spend his labor and his effort in order that you can be his own. And you know what? This God, he doesn't just give us his kingdom, and his righteousness. But as Jesus said in this gospel lesson, he has all those other things on as well. Out of his goodness, God doesn't just simply provide the forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation, but he provides all the things that his children need for life on this earth, and he does it all without our worry and our anxiety. Peter so eloquently expressed that thought through the Holy Spirit when he wrote, cast all your anxiety on him, because he is anxious for you. Thus, the answer to anxiety that Jesus gives is to seek the God who is found in the gospel, the God who freely gives all of his gifts, and not only that, but who also provides for the desires of every living thing. And to drive home the point that God has the power to do just that, to provide for the needs of his children on this earth, Jesus, he points us to the sermon that's preached by some of the, the humblest and most insignificant creatures on this earth. Jesus said, look at the birds in the air. They neither sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? You've all seen plenty of birds in your life. But I'd be willing to bet that you've never seen a bird hopping and riding onto a John Deere tractor to plow up a field and to plant some seeds. Right? I'd imagine out of all the birds nests you've seen in the trees, and in a couple of months from the least fall, you're going to see a bunch of them. I dare you to find a one that has a barn attached to it or a pantry in it to store some extra food. Birds don't do that, and yet God feeds those birds. But here's the most important question. Who's more valuable to God? Those birds? Or you? And even though I'm pretty sure you can all come up with the right answer to that one, if there's any shadow of a doubt in your mind, just look at the cross. Look at the cross and, and see who is there. It's Jesus, the God-man. Or recall Jesus' words, and why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his glory was arrayed like one of these. 
But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? God spares no expense in how he clothes the grass of the field with beauty. And so Jesus is right to point out how little our faith is when we let those anxieties and worries of this life get the better of us. After all, those worries are tiny. They're insignificant compared to that God who loves and cares for us. And so what an awesome answer to anxiety Jesus gives to us. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Set your heart on that God who gives all of his gifts free. Then you will begin to be able to put into practice those words Jesus said. Do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. I love the comfort of those words. Just sink into your heart for a minute. Consider how a believer from a, a bygone generation explained and expounded on, on those words of comfort. If the morrow is to do the worrying, we are free. And as the morrow is always in the future and just beyond us, our worries are also always to be beyond our reach. That is the desire of that Savior God who desires to be our master. May he be such a master who is the answer to all of our anxieties. Amen. Please stand. <laughs> And now the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen.